Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day uh, of Good Life Sweden Turkey and our panel discussion today. Uh, my name is Norgül. Uh, I'm an architect and founder of AnyLab. And today, uh, actually, our panel called Adapting and Adding to the ex Existing, uh, where we all be talking about the valuable approach uh, on using timber and possibilities of timber by witnessing uh, new ways to achieve sustainability in architecture uh, with different practices. And uh, actually, our goal today is, is that whatever your role is in architecture and the built environment, uh, that you will go away with something, uh, a new idea or a fresh perspective after our panel. So uh, I just want to do really do quick introductions. Uh, we have Yelda Agin from University of Cambridge, Center for Natural Material Innovation. Uh, she has been researching on advantages and disadvantages of natural elements, potentials, obstacles, and indeed advantages of uh, using wood in adaptive reuse projects. Uh, so I'm sure her talk will give us insights uh, from the material perspective. Welcome, Yada. Uh, we have Matthew Eastwood from Tangum Architects, uh, who has the experience on big scale wooden uh, buildings and saw that complexity, advantages of using wood. Uh, we would like to hear uh, his thoughts on mass timber structures and retrofits. Welcome, Matthew. And we have Mert Eyler from MEMA London, who has the passion on researching the boundaries of architecture as a profession. I'm sure he will raise questions to our minds on materials, sustainability, and future. Welcome, Mert. And we have Stefan Hoberg from uh, Gelander Hoberg Architects who has the unique experience on existing old structures, getting a new life through additions where timber plays a really central role with a sustainable and community-driven approach. Uh, welcome, Stephen. And so welcome to all of you. Uh, and here's the format to give you an idea of what to expect today. We will listen each panelist's uh, presentations. Then I will kick off the conversation, asking questions questions and so please write down any questions uh, you have to ask uh, that I will end up the panel uh, and now let's please welcome our first presenter uh, Yelda uh, floor is yours thank you Nargo for the introductions and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the circle team and Wood Life Sweden for this important event it's been a, it's a pleasure to be here with all the experts and share our research I'm going to share my screen now can you see it well? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Uh, so yes, my name is Yael Dagin. I'm an architect and a PhD candidate at the Center for Natural Material Innovation in Cambridge. So today I'm going to be presenting three research-based design projects with engineering timber by our research center. The Center for Natural Material Innovation in Cambridge is a cross-disciplinary research center directed by Dr. Michael Ramage. And we aim to bring together people and research in plant sciences, biochemistry, chemistry, engineering, and architecture. And through innovative research and experimentation, we aim to transform the way we build to achieve net zero carbon emissions. So why is it so important? Being beautiful and healthy aside, natural materials are not high embodied carbon materials like steel and concrete. Construction industry today is responsible for 40% of the global energy and process related carbon dioxide emissions. And 11% of these emissions are caused by manufacturing building materials like cement, steel, and glass. The industry has been mostly focusing on the operational carbon caused by buildings, such as healing, cooling, etc. but embodied carbon caused by the choice of materials are equally important. By 2050, 70% of the world's population is expected to be living in urban areas. That means 40 billion square meters of construction demand is estimated for the next 20 years. So if you continue to supply this demand with embodied, high embodied carbon materials like steel and concrete, it's only going to make it worse. Just demand production is responsible for roughly 8% of the global carbon emissions. And like big news agencies like BBC and Guardian also has started to acknowledge this part. So we need to quit the 20th century way of fabricating building materials, which requires brutal mineral extraction and high energy consumption for manufacturing materials. We should start working with nature instead of working against nature to design and build our buildings. 
So at the core of our research, we are aiming for buildings like on the right instead of the concrete buildings on the left. The one on the right is an 18th story mixed use building by wall architecture. So today it's possible to build high rise, high -rise buildings with timber. Here in the background, we see a residence built in timber for one of the colleges in Cambridge. If we compare the embodied, meaning the amount of carbon required to fabricate and construct these materials, the researchers found out that concrete has 2.5 times and still for almost four times the amount of embodied carbon compared to the same timber building. This calculation was also based on the fact that each kilogram of timber holds 1.8 kilogram carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, the carbon storing ability of timber buildings is usually not taken into consideration. So the more we grow trees, the more they absorb carbon from the atmosphere, and then we can store this carbon as timber buildings, then reuse it or recycle it, which makes it an ideal material for the circular economy. So what did we do in the Center for Material, Material Innovation to promote and encourage the use of timber in architecture and construction? We do multidisciplinary research, publish research papers, we support strategic planning and policy documents to make an impact. Equally important, we collaborate with architectural and engineering practices by combining our applied research capabilities with the expertise of leading designers. We establish a circle of design-led research and research-led design. There is still so much to discover and implement, not just in terms of uh, design or material properties, but also policy and the reality of construction. In that sense, collaboration between research and practice is essential. So I will be presenting three very different scale projects focused on the innovative use of timber with adapting to the current situations. The first project, uh, first research project is Oakwood Towers slash super tall timber project. It was funded by an EPSRC award and carried out collaboration with PLP architects and Smith Woolwork engineers. Uh, and the main aim was to create a technically feasible high-rise design. So our proposal challenged the standard notion of hybrid construction that typically compromises of concrete core structures. And in this image, you see how much it takes to grow timber and like how much material we need to build with timber. So actually with sustainable forestation, uh, we have enough timber to build houses, especially in Europe. So this project was an adaption to Barbican Center in London. Again, it's a research project. Barbican is one of the landmarks of London as a mixed use residential and cultural center. Oakwood Tower was proposed at 315 meters high and it would provide thousand new residents with accommodation. So here we see the current Barbican building and the proposal was an attachment of five more stories in timber to the current concrete structure. Uh, this was possible because the concrete structure of Barbican is strong enough to carry additional loads and because the uh, uh, building codes back then when Barbican was uh, constructed required a stronger concrete building. The innovation behind the design for the timber tower investigated the bridge truss method that achieves essential external stability. So the bridge-like outer frame was introduced and a symmetrical square footprint for additional stability was there too. In this image, we see our team testing the compression of columns in 1.5 square meter to see how they behave. Like these huge columns will be essential to build those high rise buildings. And it, they uh, perform quite well in compression tests. Uh, the second project is a smaller scale, it's more like a, a small city scale, it's a primary school extension in Cambridge. And we are currently in progress for design, collaborating with Walter Silton Architects and Smith and Woolwork Engineers. Uh, since still like work in progress, the images I'm going to show about this project will be quite brief to uh, tell you about our approach. Uh, so currently the primary school exists in the Trumpington area in Cambridge, also the primary school. And like where you see the arrow, there's like a temporary existing building. And the school requested us to replace this with a, a timber building as an adaptation to the existing school. 
in addition to the existing school. So in the center of our design autos, we would like to provide a healthy place to learn for students. Further benefits of timber construction include positive emotional and psychological factors related to health and well-being. Research suggests that people relax more around timber and wood materials and that children in classrooms generally perform better in test situations. So the program is quite simple with two classrooms and a multi-purpose hall. And while designing this program, uh, we are aiming to use a sustainable and recyclable capabilities of timber uh, with a long lasting building and low embodied carbon. It's also important for us to have a systematic approach with engineering timber, which is both adaptable and prefabricated. So at the end of their life cycles, these schools might be, depending on how they are designed, disassembled and reassembled, or new schools can be built uh, quickly and efficiently for uh, existing schools and new schools. So we are having a kit of parts approach, which is a low carbon kit of component parts combined to create an adaptable building module um, to create uh, what I just explained. Uh, this is another building by Walter Silton Architects, which is under construction. It's Wood House in London. The reason why I'm showing this video uh, is because you see how easy, quiet, and fast it is to construct a wooden building uh, in an existing city condition. Because like, a lot of our cities, uh, London, Istanbul, going through like lots of renovations and changes. So wood is a very sustainable and uh, adaptable approach while doing these changes. And the last project I'm going to present is a much smaller scale uh, unfolding. And uh, this was done for London Design Biennale this year. And the subject was, can we design a better world? And we were invited to design a pavilion uh, with this concept. Uh, so this is the first project I showed tower was in a big scale adaptation to the existing Barbican Center and the second one was like a, a smaller building scale adaptation to a primary school. This one uh, was originated from the idea of like creating flexible partitions for houses so it's adapting in a more interior scale using the timber and this was a collaboration with PLP Architecture and Dukta Flexible Wood. And this was designed last year during the pandemic when everyone was in lockdown. So on the right hand side, you see our screenshots from Zoom sessions when it was all designed uh, with Zoom meetings and some of us were in different countries as well. And uh, it was originated from a PhD research of one of our members, Anna Gato, and she's looking into uh, affordable housing with digital timber. And as a part of her research, she's uh, looking into curving, curf bending with curving for timber and how these pieces can be uh, flexible um, uh, partitions for the houses. And we wanted to use that idea for that uh, pavilion and we wanted to combine it with the folding idea and see like how instead of like a straight folding, we can use curving pieces to fold this together. And we did many tests to see the bending capabilities of timber by curving, as you see in this image. Uh, a part of our team also created a parametric model to see different options and possibilities we have. And like on the top left, you see one of the options uh, in Somerset House, because Biennale was going to be in Somerset House, which is a beautiful uh, space with all these walls. So we also tested uh, how of all of these iterations will look in the space. And prototyping was super important for us. So in the workshop we have, we had MDF cuts of these like options, folding options and see how different connections can work, different gaps can work and the lighting effects created by it. And then once we decided uh, the form we're gonna go for, we uh, cut bigger pieces in the uh, Grimestyke farm, uh, our collaborator with the CNC machines. And here we see the panels and how they were organized. And it was like meant to be flat pack panels, like brought to the side uh, plaque because a life cycle uh, in our designs are really 
important for us, like circle of life in design and the building. So like this was planned in a way it could be like flat pack, assembled again, disassembled again. Uh, so like it's going to continue its life cycle. And we use three different type of materials. We use uh, all wood, but um, 18 millimeter panels, six millimeter panels and CLT panels for the bottom combined in this way. So here you see the final product uh, on exhibition space uh, in full scale. And it was meant to be sort of like uh, imitating an urban forest, if you like, and like providing visitors uh, a kind of enjoyable and thoughtful, um, thoughtful walk around this pavilion to think about the future of uh, London or cities in general and like how timber can be a part of it with this flexible and adaptive um, qualities it has. And as I said, like at the end of life cycle, the pieces were flat pack again and now stored uh, for their next presentation space, which continues their life cycle. Uh, so this is the whole team here. And like you can see some of the reflections we created with this design in the exhibition space. Uh, this was my presentation in a nutshell. I hope I didn't exceed my time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do contact us for further questions and collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, like this uh, beautiful examples that inspiring the relation between the practice and the research. I think we will need to think about more this uh, collaboration, maybe after our panel. So thank you. And uh, let's please welcome our second presenter. Uh, please, stage is yours, Matthew. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you. Nogo. And uh, inspiring work, Yelda. Very nice to see. Thanks for sharing. Um, Speaking of sharing, I'll share my desktop here, uh, the screen, uh, and we'll just jump right into the presentation here. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm going to introduce you to one of uh, our projects, Tricot Fabriken, uh, that we design on behalf of our client, Father Bien. Let's see, let me advance the slide here. Uh, the property is called Trikorpa Bacon in, in translation, the fabric factory, and it relates to the property's original use and located in Hanabi Khostad, uh, a sustainable city district located south from the Stockholm central area. It's a major redevelopment area since the beginning of the 90s uh, with a high sustainability profile, previously an industrial site with a brownfield. When finalized, the area will house about 13,000 apartments and about 400,000 square meters of business space, of which about 150,000 square meters will be office space. And this particular project will work on this office space. Uh, the property is located close to the public transportation and in the heart of the redevelopment industrial area that was turned into commercial space. Specific for the Hanabi Hurstad area is the Hanabi environmental model, which focuses on closing the loops energy, materials, water, and waste. Uh, one of the special features of the area is a high focus on creating high value green and blue space, making them accessible to the inhabitants and to visitors. Our client Fabigier approached us to come up with a concept to combine four separate adjacent buildings congregated around an open courtyard into one new building. This included re-envisioning and modernizing the existing buildings and having a concept for a new addition to the build that remained within the planning development rights. Uh, each of the four buildings were built in the architectural style of the era, an important aspect of the project which, which motivated us to preserve the existing uh, and carry on the tradition of introducing new year rings and grain of the building. Uh, our first concept was to visually open up the bottom floor to the street and connect the building and its users to the neighborhood. Uh, the complex is a cluster of buildings, uh, each with its own end pieces. And our second idea was to consolidate all these end pieces and narrow it down to two, creating an interior street and leading the building's users uh, to the central courtyard, the heart of the building. Uh, looking at the different ways to build an addition, it became clear that we had to demolish one story, a uh, uh, one story of building A from 1944 uh, uh, edition on the 1929 building, and two stories uh, right down to street level on building D, uh, which was a 1980s edition. 
uh, we've proposed a new seven-story addition to the building B, which now which would house uh, tenant space as well as a group of new elevators. And a new five-story addition to building A was proposed, but how was how would we uh, form this addition? Uh, working with the developmental rights, uh, we were allowed a height of 22 meters adjoining the street, whereupon we had to stay within a 45 degree line projecting in towards the center of the block B. Practically speaking, this allowed for a three story addition and two additional stories within the attic space. An important aspect of the development was to minimize the impact of reduced daylight to street level and to adjacent properties. Uh, this is the resulting volume. Uh, the north facing gable is entirely glazed, allowing maximizing daylight uh, without heat gain, opening up to neighborhood and city views in the descending terrain, and showcasing the unique wood structure within. This is also where the main entrance is located. Uh, a glass waste is introduced, clearly demarcating between old and new. The glass waste wraps around the entire building and to the south where the second um, entrance can be seen. Uh, and the iconic form of the North Gable is mirrored on the south, this time adapted uh, with glazing uh, for, for the uh, higher soil exposure. Within the existing courtyard, a system of stairs and catwalks are introduced. Uh, these serve as the main public circulation, both vertically and horizontally, connecting to each tenant space this allows for maximizing the amount of tenant space within uh, each of the existing building bodies. It also uh, creates a very intuitive way to navigate the building. Uh, the courtyard is capped with a glass roof forming a new atrium. Uh, the new conditioned space allows for year-round public activities and can be used as breakout space for tenants while letting in daylight. The remaining roof areas serve as space for photovoltaic panels on the blue area, green roofs, the remaining uh, roof areas without solar panels, and of course, the rooftop terrace uh, for tenant use. As the property is located in a sustainable city district, it was not strange that it had high sustainability ambitions. The most sustainable building is, of course, the one that's never built. Using existing building stock, not only reduces the potential impact to the environment and climate, it also creates social values by preserving the historic value. From the very start, uh, it was a team's ambition to preserve as much as possible, as well as to create as little as possible negative impact to the existing structure. A more traditional setting, um, in a more traditional, the easiest would be to demolish and, and build a new building from scratch. In our case, an estimated 80% carbon dioxide savings was achieved by reusing the existing building and a thoughtful choice of materials for the addition. The building is certified to bring a standard of very good. Uh, this meant that there were some guiding indicators for the team to fulfill, like using life cycle analysis for analyzing and motivating the choice of materials, having low energy use and solar energy production. Roughly 500 square meters of solar cells, as I've mentioned, and green that were installed. Um, and then, of course, uh, the terrace is an important um, social aspect uh, for the new use. Beehives were in introduced as well to um, improve local biodiversity. Uh, and uh, being close to the city center was also important to promote biking. So, indoor bicycle parking uh, with changing rooms uh, was provided. A lot of focus was given to waste and water management, as well as materials that were chosen. All the materials used have been chosen for their lifespan, maintenance requirements, and general environmental footprint. They were all verified as part of the certification. Uh, timber was the most obvious choice for the addition construction, being the most environmental and human-friendly material. Two-thirds of Swedish land area is covered with forests, so all timber used uh, in its construction is locally sourced and produced. As a renewable energy, it reduces the climate impact of this particular addition by 50%, as opposed to using concrete and steel. Uh, timber is a light material, which reduced also the need for extensive re reinforcement of the ground and minimizing the impact of the existing construction. So reinforcing this historic building could be minimized. 
uh, as prefabricated elements, time for the construction on site was much shorter compared to conventional building, drastically reducing the waste on site. Construction itself was quieter and safer. Timber creates long-term value, not only by capturing carbon that would have otherwise been released into the air by normal decomposition, uh, the decomposition process of timber in the forest. It also is reusable, fully, dis fully disassemblable, and of course, upcyclable. From a human perspective, timber is an obvious choice. Uh, research shows that uh, in timber buildings where wood is exposed to the interior, people are less stressed and their blood pressure is lower. Thermal comfort is better, regulated by timber buildings. Acoustics are better. Even smell contributes uh, to how, uh, how people feel better. Timber also stabilizes indoor relative humidity by absorbing and giving off uh, humidity as, as um, the difference um, grows. Uh, one could talk about benefits of wood for ages, frankly. Uh, so just to show you a little bit of the building, here's a north-south section through the atrium that illustrates the main entrance on the right-hand side, leading to the atrium, the catwalks uh, uh, for the horizontal and the stairs for the vertical circulation, and how the, uh, the old, uh, which is the, this part of the building, meets the new timber portion. Uh, here are a couple of perspectives of the final design of the facade. And then some elevations just showing like which parts are additions and which parts uh, were preserved as, as existing. So you see building D uh, over here is, a, is from the street level up is a new and then building A from the uh, third level up. Uh, just a close up of, of the um, elevations and, and how we actually uh, just use the relationship of the existing building and borrowed a lot of geometries and design um, uh, tricks and it, uh, used them and implemented them on, a, on the addition itself to create a stronger relationship and not um, copy the existing building. And the yellow band here in this case indicates an exposed timber frame behind the curtain. Uh, in terms of material choices, uh, the brick was our point of departure. Um, and we picked Porten for the exterior uh, facade as it uh, had similar qualities to brick, uh, raw, and a patina, and it also harkens back to the industrial past. Um, graphite gray was chosen for all metals such as window frames, guardrails, handrails, etc., as a common thread weaving through all the buildings from all the areas, offering a cool tone as a counterpoint to the warm tones of brick and Porten. Light gray plaster was selected for building D addition, again, to contrast the brick and the Cortan. Uh, fur of the exposed structure in Ibu lens and CLTs was left untreated on the interior and served as the warm, friendly interior counterpart to the brick and Cortan on the exterior. Here's a structural section through north-south uh, showing um, through building A, and it shows uh, the mass timber addition on top. And then in the uh, existing building, our uh, lateral reinforcement that was uh, introduced in order to uh, take the loads. And then lastly, the foundation reinforcing uh, below. And here's a plan illustrating pretty much the same principles. Uh, building A here is, is where we did uh, the majority of the uh, timber addition and building B here. Um, all the uh, stair cores and elevated cores, as well as the the um, cores inside this uh, building section were uh, used for uh, lateral stability. And even the exterior walls, uh, where the CLT was used for exterior walls, um, provide lateral stability to the whole structure. And also here you can see the introduction of the, uh, the catwalks uh, within the atrium space. Uh, here's a typical section through building A showing the meeting between the existing brick building below here and, and the timber addition above. Uh, and here's showing a sequence uh, of the stages of construction beginning with the existing conditions, uh, the selective demolition, uh, the construction of the mass timber sculpture frame, 
and then the thermal envelope is introduced. And lastly, the uh, glazed openings. And now just a series of images taking you through construction. Uh, here's our building arriving flat packed. And if you're familiar with the Ia, the concept is quite similar. This is the first piece of structure uh, installed and it's part of the elevator shaft. And it's basically three stories installed in, in, in one sweep. Um, and this is what was accomplished up just on the first day. And further seeing the, the elevator cores and uh, the, the stairwells. And here's a connection between the old below and the new above. Some reinforcement of the old. And here we're seeing very few locations where steel was used here to keep beam depths shallow to facilitate duct exits from main ventilation shafts. Because uh, this building had to meet the same floor to floor heights as the adjoining buildings, and they're uh, designed uh, in an earlier era, um, preserving the headspace was very important in the point. Uh, find ways to, to keep the, uh, the new installation of all, all the systems as compact as possible was a, was a challenge. Uh, here you also see uh, the old and the new adjacent to one another, the old exterior process, so visible higher up. Uh, clean, concealed connections between beams and columns. The full picture of mass timber frame from within, the full raised uh, flooring is installed. Uh, attic level with its sloped roofs and a completed floor prior to final finishes being installed. Even the stairs are mass timber. And here the finished mass timber frame uh, receiving the first floor, uh, roofing elements, uh, which you can see on the top right there. Uh, now for the final product. Here's the main entrance. Moving through the airlock into the lobby and entering the atrium. The atrium roof above. Old versus new with activity in the atrium. inside looking in. Here's a typical office space. You can see the mass timber is exposed on the exterior walls. Um, the reading room, similarly, with a lot of exposed timber. And now just to present the transformation. Here's the original building in 1929, first building in, in the area. This is circa 19, oh, sorry, 2014, uh, right prior to construction commencing. And the final product today. Thanks for letting me show our project. Oh, thank you, Matthew. Actually, to see the process motivates us to think beyond adding extension to existing building. It's much more than that. So uh, I hope that uh, a lot of clients <laughs> watching this one, having uh, more clients who want to timber buildings as well. Uh, thank you again. And uh, now our third presenter, uh, Max. Uh, now floor is yours. You can. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, everything is clear, I think. This yeah. My screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you uh, for a uh, very kind invitation. And, and thank you, Circle, New Lafay, and the all staff. Um, my title of presentation is Open Structure. Um, it's too hard to talk about the 10 minutes in wooden or timber structure. 
And uh, I want to explain the becoming our architectural practices. Here is this some topics uh, which I will highlight. Uh, the, the first one is forest, wooden structure, R&D. Uh, very impressive projects are goals. And then clients. And I want to talk uh, about last project briefly. And uh, the last word is maybe sustainability or continuity, meaning for us. Here we go. The first uh, is uh, for. Uh, I am always curious about the invisible part of the whole, and always ask many questions. What might be behind the wood? Once. I was talking with a friend uh, whom Kevin uh, was working on sociology. Uh, I asked him what could be the very first structure in Istanbul. And he said, uh, what about the forest? So I was thinking about the Hagia Sophia or Yerburga scale. Uh, can a forest be an uh, accumulation? I found the forest as a diversity, a quality, a source of information, and a kind of library. And um, maybe does, uh, what about the structure? Uh, what kind of material? Uh, does a steel structure look like a forest? Or does a wooden structure also a part of forest? Um, I, I think the trace of wood on the rainforest concrete surfaces has the same feeling for us. And I want to talk about that trace. We tried to develop a proposal uh, after the Cathedral Notre Dame de Paris fire. When we learned that it was old. After that, uh, we changed our proposal and roof structure from the 12th or 13th century. And in this century, we may not have to manufacture a wooden roof structure anymore. I believe in that. Uh, is there another way to build the roof structure or another method? For example, can we use a precast concrete buttresses with CAT CAM technology? Flying buttresses will uh, lose their structural expression as they rise and turn into 3D concrete pattern like a rising sculpture. And this pattern will carry water to the roof, to the ground or life ground to the sky as the gargoyles of this century, of this time. And um, maybe um, vertical and horizontal elements are framing a structure. I am searching for the simplest structure, as simple as anyone can do, but building, uh, but building a simple structure is more complicated than a complex one. What I expect from a simple structure is creating a civil impact, a civil representation, or maybe very simple human being. And um, another uh, impressive phase uh, in our practice is an R&D, research and development. In daily life, uh, the demand for architecture services continues as if it's to produce cool buildings, heat things, or ingenious structures. I think research and development can be done when we go out of the comfort zone. London is a kind of R&D or research and development zone for us. I believe that we have to go out of the comfort zone and wooden and timber construction is another uncomfort zone for us. Also wooden or timber construction is a kind of research and development. 
By the way, I discovered existing network between the three under, yeah, sorry, uh, under the trees. And I explained how wood and tradition and industry can be together. I must say the net, that network of trees reminded me um, that I am connected to Kuzguncuk. It helped me to read to understand my own forest. Here we go. Um, so uh, I would like to share another uh, research project for us, thank like Goss. Um, when we were working on a huge building, uh, it's nearly 180 meters long rainforest concrete steel structure, formed only by trucks movements and ramps. This effort carried out the invited competition organized by the gas management. Now, um, I, I want to uh, invite you to this project. Uh, could you turn up the volume a bit, please? Uh, Love a huge industrial area where large volumes of tin can industrial buildings come together and accumulate almost like a city. The first thing that, that came to our mind was how we could meet the density and this program with pedestrians. We aim to push the structure to achieve a big green. And the area we wanted to green up almost turned into a forest. And we thought the structural wood or laminated wood experiment as a step forward. Can we get rid of wet manufacturing? We said if everything was produced in the workshop and we would only meet on the site to combine all of them. It was important to get things right up the intensive production in the workshop. The work we prepared, we prepared for goals was rewarded the European Architecture Center and we were selected to 40 and 40 and the step forward to London. Research and development phase worked. And um, uh, I want to talk my friends or maybe I want to talk with my clients. Um, our architecture services were always demanded by our close friends. Because of that, we always felt like we built an architecture of friendship. We like a network between the trees. And again, we shortlisted. We designed a daily life. It's a kind of the others, another kind of archetype. And I want to introduce you, Karen, who was three years old and my youngest friend, my client, my employer. Uh, 
and Kerem called himself a salamander. And we designed him a wooden structure lying and hiding among the trees as a game or as a toy. And um, and another institute, AIA UK, saw our effort, and we were shortlisted again. It makes us happy to receive a reward for this process. By the way, and yeah, here is the Karen swinging there. And um, some of pictures about the process. These were Salamander's workshops process. Scratched, joined, inserted, relocated, and then we put in a place with a precise measurement. And if you ask why all this care and discussions, or uh, why all these questions, one word that describes the process of gathering, architecture unites people. And one day I woke up with lines, like similar timber lines. And I said, I'll draw these sticks now. And these watercolors came out and this is how the wood was reflected on the paper. Uh, uh, in a meeting uh, we had for Salamander, Merve and Selim uh, talked together and Merve uh, said about the process. We went through uh, the about emotional entanglement. Could the entanglement be the forest itself, or I just as as described? And 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 then uh, yeah, I'm completing the presentation by uh, explaining the renovation of Mezzanine building. And this workshop uh, we designed for our dearest friend. It was a simple repair. The simpler the job the harder it gets, it finds the simplest clever. It was like this for Tecne and it was like Salamander. We still need to work hard to get down the minimum instead of pushing the limits of the wooden structure. Getting other materials together when necessary, creating diversity like living in a jungle, um, instead of ascribing the great meanings to wood or any building or any elements alone, can we create a harmony with the others? Um, I want to show you the snail. Uh, here, where is the snail? And here is the process. Ah. Um, I find the snail's journey zone still prov provocative. What does a nature mean? Steel or concrete, also natural for us. And uh, the last thing is continuity or sustainability. Um, uh, all of them I have mentioned above for me. I can say that we flow between industry 5,0 and industry 1,0. Between steam engines and artificial intelligence, striking for the climate is in fact 
similar to writing code for a journey to Mars. Uh, and I am curious about the Mars. If we were to design on Mars, how would we decide which material to use and which structure to build? Uh, that's all. Oh. That's my <laughs> turn and over. Thank you. Thank you, Mert. Now we have a lot of questions in our minds. Thank you for this uh, beautiful presentation. And now uh, we have uh, Last presenter, uh, floor is yours, Stefan. Thank you very much. And I hope you can see that. So I guess I will be finishing slightly after one since we are a bit late, but I, I'll do my best not to exceed the time. Thank you so much for the invitation, everyone. Uh, so we are Kjellander Sjöberg from Sweden, Stockholm, and we have an office in Malmö as well, close to the Danish border, and we are also starting up a business in London currently. Um, so for this presentation, um, uh, sorry, yes, sorry, I can't, yeah. So for this presentation, I'm going to show you a building we're currently working on in Malmö. And I will also show you an uh, addition to an existing building in Stockholm that is part of the exhibition Woodlife in Istanbul at the moment. So we go to a lot of seminars and this is a great seminar because it's focused on practitioners that actually act together with researchers to formulate better ideas for a sustainable future and a safe future. Uh, but we always tell ourselves that what can we really do about these things right here, right now, because I think we know pretty much a lot, many of the answers and the paths we need to take. Uh, so it's really about in a practice, what can we do right here, right now, and to answer all the serious questions that are at stake currently. And we think it's actually quite fundamental that we put architecture in a role where it's supposed to be, like to provide shelter, to provide education, places to provide community uh, where it's needed. And we think we can do so by using local resources, maybe having a low tech, a simple approach at times where it's possible together we kind of high tech uh, design methods and production methods. Um, one of our kind of dream projects that we're really happy to start working on was the Jutriet in Malmö, which is a foundry in the old industrial parts of the industrial harbor in Southern Sweden in Malmö. So this site has a long heritage it's it the wharf was like the foundation of the economy around the turn of the century up to the 40s and it's really seen by many people as a strong part of the identity like the pride of Malmö and one of the key buildings is the one that you see here in the back uh, the foundry uh, which was built like an industrial basilica with two quite prominent gables uh, at the time when we started um, it was actually in a quite poor state more like industrial ruin you might say where the character fe characteristic features are the existing steel frame and the parts of the uh, brick walls in very kind of different uh, shape um, conditions currently um, so we went about this the way we usually do we tried to read the urban fabric um, and the fabric of the existing building um, the client, Varvstaden, who is now developing the old harbor area into a, a vivid and a vibrant city area with education, universities, workplaces, and new housing. Um, so their ambition is to tie into the social sustainability uh, values and to create a building that is low on carbon investment and also low in energy uh, consumption. In the, in, the, in the long run. So we looked at this as a building, as a home, and how can we attach to the neighbors like creating these interfaces and these meeting spaces around the building with a dock to the north, uh, having open and flexible spaces for exhibitions and showrooms. Uh, to the south, to the quay, which will be a main route in Malmö with a new bridge, bridge on the right, to really open this building up. 
uh, this will be workspaces, but still having an interface to the public, to the public realm. Varstaden also has has had to demolish some of the older industrial buildings, and they created like a material bank for building materials. So a huge foundation of this project was to how can we build as little as possible and reuse as much as possible, and where we need to add new building components, how can they be regenerative? So of course we were looking at timber and wood to for the pieces we needed to produce and manufacture new. So the building, the envelope of the building has four sides and they're in really different type of conditions. So each side actually needs a different architecture and technical approach, we thought. So the long Western facade was originally like this. And when we started, it had actually been like an inside of another adjacent warehouse building. So even though this architecture is really beautiful, like a collage uh, with aggregations of different time eras, uh, we would like to preserve it somehow. The old um, wall had been sealed up with new uh, infills and we would like to open that up, but still uh, needed like a thermal uh, layer of protection not to have frost cracking of the walls. So we proposed to use recycled bricks as a new layer, having bigger openings, open up the old openings from the inside. So from inside you will see the old wall and from the outside, outside you will kind of get a hint of that. Um, the Basilica gables are more intact today, so they should could be amended and repaired and with some added new openings to them. So what we took as a point of departure was the existing shell, which was kind of broken and beautiful, and then we inserted new timber volumes of two types to create like a spatial sequence within the building. Um, we hung 50% of the frame into the existing frame. Um, so we got like new floors and new platforms and new levels of the building. Um, this is of course old sea um, soil. So this was like not really like solid ground to build on. So if we could hang the frame and we can add timber that is really lightweight, we could save a lot of the cost for, for the foundation uh, construction. And we also thought that by adding new kind of hanging and standing volumes within the space, we would create these kind of nested space where you can find your place to work, kind of your home and belonging within the bigger structure. Also, uh, an aim was to like really preserve uh, the kind of big um, conservation uh, protected uh, space of the basilica by adding uh, new floors and new volumes that are not attaching actually to the outer walls. Um, so this will be a headquarter for the food production company Oatly uh, and their products are based on oats of like organic and recyclable materials. So we thought timber was actually a good, um, a good um, choice for this because trees and oat could be you know kind of meat and the requirement from that from the tenant was that their products are always like healthy they taste good and they are sustainable so we tried to create something that perhaps doesn't taste good but something that smells good and feels good to touch and just behaves in a really nice way in microclimate terms so the headquarter for Oatly will open up to the community and they will invite people like the academia and people to have coffee and taste their products and, and have uh, a meal. Uh, and also they, they thought they could really do this, uh, could really benefit from this openness, having an interaction and getting some inspiration from the people, people visiting. So this volume here you see is like hanging uh, in the existing uh, beams, like the old transfer structures that were used to move steel in the old days. Um, also, the, there is this sense of shortcuts and informal workspaces. Uh, Oatly was a really small company and now it's expanding globally, um, but a lot of meetings and decisions are made in the corridors. So we have like sneakways along the facade and you have bridges across the main 
nave of the building to shape this kind of informal uh, workspace quality. And this is on site now. And what was reassuring and a bit promising for the future was that the cost of this frame were actually much cheaper than expected. Uh, it was a really rapid and quick assembly of the frame. And uh, PIAB, the construction company, was actually quite relieved that this was such an easy way to build in this setting. And as you see, there was no roof on the building when we started, so you could lift in all the timber components easily in sight. And I won't go through this project so deeply since we are a bit short of time, but Magnolia is also an addition to an existing building. In this new area, there was needed like a, a meeting space and, and the restaurant space with around an existing buildings in the center of a new uh, urban development. So the existing building houses community functions and the big industrial kitchen for deliveries for schools and other community amenities. So we placed the addition close to that kitchen facing a small uh, square. Um, and we were like mimicking a bit the existing buildings with their steep gabled roofs um, uh, with a new type of construction in, in timber, where actually the frame is what shapes the kind of spatial experience and the sequence of the room. Um, it was very like one-to-one. -one. What you see is what you get. So constructing the frame was like actually the only thing that shapes uh, the architecture in a way. So I will end there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you for all actually those stimulating remarks, all of you. Uh, we all feel like we are in a wood revolution right now. So, but since we are almost out of time, like 30 seconds, <laughs> uh, we will continue our discussion and take your questions and uh, to our speakers in Hopi networking area. Uh, be sure to keep in mind that wood as a renewable resource and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and thank you again for your all contributions, Stefan, Mert, Matthew and Yelda. Uh, now we will go into the networking area together. Uh, but I think Feyza Hanım said that it's okay to extend the panel. Maybe uh, we, then we, we can <laughs> I ask you some questions about uh, your topics that uh, for all listeners. Uh, maybe it's, uh, there, there, is a, there is this question uh, of uh, what's your prediction about the next five years in the, this wood industry? Because in a perspective, maybe we can begin with Yelda Hanım, uh, that perspective of material research, and as you mentioned, the, the relations between the research and the practice. What's your thought about future? Uh, I think future really depends on the policy. Like we really need to pressure governments to put more attention on natural materials and like all the building codes and regulations because like I think number one hindrance we have for building natural materials are building codes and regulations for timber, for earth, for all the natural materials we're working with. And while uh, Nordic countries are doing great with that, as we've seen the high rise buildings over there, and also I think Canada and states are doing great with regulations. Many. European countries, like including UK, also Turkey, I think is way behind. So I think we need to promote this. We need to, um, because like there are not many contractors who are available or who knows how to work with timber. And that's a big uh, complication. And one of the main reasons is like insurance. Like it's really harder to insure building buildings. So like I would say policy insurance and knowledge is very important to have. Um, and also education, like teaching students, architecture, engineering students, how to build with timber. I think those are gonna be like game changing, um, let's say uh, elements to have more natural materials in the future. And we don't have much time left with climate crisis. So I also hope like governments will soon implement the carbon taxes, which will really accelerate uh, the natural materials and architecture and design. 
Yeah, thank you. And we are all aware of this, uh, the time that we are in, but maybe also, as you said, education is important. Maybe I could jump to Matthew because also we need to educate our clients as well. So Matthew, how, uh, what are the, some of the challenges that you have encountered in persuading clients to accept like mass timber as a viable structure material? Uh, maybe what are the, some of the most common misconceptions that they have? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually, and that was probably one of our largest challenges with this project was um, uh, our client actually did their own research and came to the same conclusion as, as we had, that timber was a good choice for this building and there were a lot of advantages. So they, they invested a lot of their own time in, in that journey and that was important and that was good having a client that was, that was willing to, to do that homework, it's necessary homework, to, to become comfortable with it. Um, and then we went through the exact same process once the contractor was selected. Um, you know, that it was their first uh, timber, uh, mass timber structure, and um, uh, they naturally uh, proposed doing traditional concrete and steel. And uh, they too went through a, a whole education process and so on, and got a lot of information from other contractors that have worked with this material before and uh, invested a lot of their own time basically and but now they're you know they're a competent mass timber contractor and, uh, and did lots of uh, award lots of uh, projects uh, based on that, that I would also like to say that um, just based on your previous uh, question uh, the mm -hmm. future um, you know one of the issues is it's very good that everything can be built with wood, but is there enough wood? So, you know, one of the, one of the trends now is basically finding ways to work more efficiently, more effectively with the wood that we have, uh, making sure that uh, our forestry practices are sustainable. Um, but uh, back to you know, development of new materials, for instance, CLTs using mm -hmm. ribbed construction, uh, using hybrid construction as well um, you know wood is very good at many things but it can't do everything so being selective about when you use wood and being uh, smart about it is very important as well mm -hmm. thank you and also uh, also stefan uh, you have this unique background like focusing large-scale urban projects and transformation as you also mentioned the like community and togetherness in the environmental conscious way what's your thought about like the picture uh, about the uh, promoting timber construction no i think uh, as as you as you said previously i think uh, uh, a main part of this is education i mean we work usually with engineers that have been doing con concrete and steel frames for a really long time and i think mm -hmm. that of course the architects are usually and should be brave and push for the new things if it's a you know good societal good overall good uh, direction but i think that education is pretty key i mean we in sweden we don't like in 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 england right now there is a bit more of a discussion with uh, regarding fire and fire in residential buildings and in sweden we have new legislation in place and it's based on like proving uh, you know providing evidence that it works and i mean thim timber is usually better than steel and concrete in fire terms we think so we don't have that problem here but i think it's more like a, you know, it takes an unorthodox approach to what is really the best way to build. I see, uh, I mean, I see two way, two things that are pretty pressing. And one is to really say that we do have a sustainable forestry uh, in, in the EU and in, in the world and in Sweden. And I think the, there is a discussion on natural habitats now. Um, but I think we usually say when we, we calculated this with big engineering firms that you could actually say that the timber building is carbon positive if you take into consideration the carbon the trees eat you know up to 70 years in sweden until they are being cut down so i think it's a good thing uh, and it's the only thing we can do but we still need to look into the kind of sustainable forestry that's number one but i think also number two for us now which is very difficult for us as architects and being a corporate a firm that is to tell the client that we shouldn't build at all like we should really use what's there uh, and do as little as possible. I mean, we're architects, okay? So we're also design driven, but we like in Uteria, it was a nice, why I said it was a dream project for us was that 
we had to choose like uh, ethical solutions over aesthetical solutions in a way because we had to use what was there what what the advice and the client have you know in the storage warehouse what could we use here and we had to use wood and of course a lot of people designers say it's an industrial building you have to use gray steel because that's what goes with the existing frame so we painted the new the old frame kind of ox blood and we use timber which is a bit unorthodox but we have to come to a point where we as architects choose the ethic, ethical solutions over what looks like a fantastic you know building and that can be fantastic <laughs> yes yes uh, i think it's all about our point of views actually to think about more and also Mert, uh, we all uh, actually admire your three-year-old client together <laughs> that having this excitement with the wood structures so uh, as your uh, what are your point of view to do like the future of the wood because you already did a lot of like scale uh, in the architectural or also in installations so what makes wood construction so exciting from your point of view in the future uh, it's a good question. And um, um, before the meeting, I uh, searched uh, many uh, understanding in many cultures in Anatolia, in Britain, um, in Kurd in Kurdish uh, culture. Said that uh, maybe I'm so sorry for the Turkish uh, Arjun. Kurdu kendindedir. It means, um, um, sorry, um, uh, uh, is the wood warm in himself? Uh, it, uh, we will have to understand the warm and the wood and timber separately, I think, and uh, different uh, vision or different projection can be made for each geography. It is very important, I think. And uh, I, uh, I uh, am uh, believe uh, in architecture, um, not construction industry. I think the wood is a kind of soul of earth. Because of that. We have to um, uh, uh, hug them uh, uh, very warm, and, and, uh, and we have to understand uh, 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 the uh, the strikes uh, the last week in in COP twenty six yeah. in Glasgow. It was very important, I think. And that's all then in my uh, region. Oh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think now we are, <laughs> we are kind of out of time, but uh, let me conclude by thanking all of your uh, presentations. And I think I really take insights onto the questions that were raised. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody who asked questions and joined us today. And thanks for the organizers of the making this wood like panel uh, possible. Uh, now I would like to invite you to the networking room through the, uh, your links uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>